Okay. Uh, it's five o'clock, and I'm, we are gathered here uh, to perform our duty under the charter. Um, we are having public hearings relative to the FY 2016 budget, and we are speaking with department heads. Uh, today is um, Wednesday, the 27th, 2015. Um, so we, for, uh, first I'll accept the motion to open the hearing. That doesn't count. Uh, uh, all those in favor of opening the hearing, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So first up, we have, um, well, it's actually somewhat bittersweet, probably more bitter for us and more sweet for the presenter, but uh, uh, Chief Sinkowitz is here for his final budget presentation, um, and that would account for a smile. So, uh, Chief, you have the floor. Oh, Sam. <laughs> um, I meant to say that. Yeah, okay. I mean, basically, it's the rear kind of you know, you've got the narrative in front of you. Uh, this shirt's a one page narrative, so you're going to have to read through my usual multiple pages of uh, kudos to all my department uh, personnel and issues that there. I mean, the only big issue is that it's highlighted is that the 6% increase um, over last year includes last year's settling for of two different contracts with patrol officers for sergeants, uh, COLAs, and steps of the civilian employees. Uh, and it's over a two-year period of time, so the six percent looks like a lot, but it's really a uh, spread through the infield in 2015. This year's budget in FY16, so it's over a two-year period of time. The other highlight is uh, you've heard me talk before about getting cars out of capital improvements. I've long lobbied for the ability to just put an extra car or two into the OLM, and the finance director and the mayor consented to do that uh, this year, so I don't have to go to capital improvements. I can but we really have, should have the flexibility of having four or five in the old one budget. That's that's got to push you along. Yeah, I'm being a landlord a long time. Thank you. I'll get your way. So, but it is. Uh, the only other big change is the, the changeover from a contract to animal control officer, which is 115,000 a year. Uh, this transition includes the one time cost of the vehicle, of some 35,000. So the total would be add up the numbers, uh, this is about 107 for this coming contract year, and then of course the year after, uh, this coming fiscal year, the year after, the dollar value will go down. And we're in the process of uh, setting up a transition plan for that. Other well, highlights for the upcoming year, just uh, we've been really active in seeking grants. Uh, as we over the past few years have been successful in fulfilling the grants, I always say folks keep coming to us and asking us to do more and more and more. Uh, so we've had clicking a ticket, we've had drunk driving, we've had uh, distracted driving, which amazingly, one four hour block of overtime got 18 people. <laughs> and they didn't use my ear putting a can healer in the uh, traffic alley and it came Damon and <laughs> point out the car for the cruiser up the road. I thought it'd be a great idea. Uh, and then we just recently are executing a contract of some interest, I explained this transportation park is uh, the PVPC, who's going to be the, the intermediary, uh, fiduciary, and the Massachusetts Highway Safety Department. It's got a creative crosswalk, it's less education enforcement. It's not only uh, picking uh, six different crosswalks in the area of Elm, Pleasant, uh, South, King, Maine, it's to discuss with people, not only educate them, but when you have a jaywalker, when you have a bicyclist that's not playing by the rules, a motor vehicle driver that doesn't uh, stop, part of the whole data collection is why. Why did you do that? So we can try to forecast and plan out further these particularly, you know, more, most common uh, intersections for motor vehicle collision, which aren't hitting pedestrians, it's rear ending other cars that stop for pedestrians. But we'll be able over a six month period of time to put data together so we can plan really what's needed there. Is it more visibility? Is it an engineering issue? Whatever it is. But it also includes the jaywalker education component, which I think is important because you're going to both sides of the issue cars don't stop and people don't. That's all 
subdivision that I set up as I'm heading off into the sunset. So, so particular questions, I'm really glad to answer any. Council's questions. I mean, we are on track <coughs> again on the 22nd here. Uh, be within budget, but close to fiscal year. So. Yes, Chief. Um, job control officer, if, are you going into a different direction? Okay. As I just spoke about, right, we're getting rid of the contract employee that had a three-year contract with us. Is that because her contract was ended? And it was a two-year discussion about trying to save some money. Uh, the Board of Health had some needs for animal inspector position. Uh, we're trying to roll it all into one. It'll be a city employee under uh, the control of the police department. And it would be some cooperation and filming from the Amherst uh, control officer there, and also the utilization of their account. Uh, that's kind of an experiment before we think about broad regionalization of animal control, which is probably the direction all the community should go in because it is a big issue. Uh, I forget what the amount is, but it's, it's a fairly nominal amount for the animal that the animal control officer catches the account over there instead of having a private contract. So, the anticipation of some cost savings long term. Like with Nancy Graham at one point, she used to bring all the dogs up to West Stanton mm -hmm. at Blue White's place. Mm -hmm. That's where she would board them. What would we do? Amherst? We would do Amherst. As I just said, we were partying with the Amherst. Makes sense. Yeah. Good question. Top Um, I said a question about regional drug task force mm -hmm. and we dedicate one full-time detective to that regional task force mm -hmm. and uh, done it for a couple of years in that case. Right? Well we've done it for a couple of years because we had grant funding to actually backfill this position. Okay. And uh, our money has run out because we're getting our staffing levels back up. We added a detective to fill his spot okay. and he is uh, still assigned probably 30 hours to the drug task force. Uh, Almost full-time. Yeah. Almost full-time. But it was looking we were, he, he was spending a lot of time in Athol and Orange, and drugs don't come from Athol and Orange to here. So we were more concerned about deciding the border. And I think Northern Hamby County, basically all the Hampshire County sources. So, I mean, he's very integral to that, but he's also our fire investigator. We're fully trained in the uh, first to fill that position. So that's, is that the region, the, essentially the district, the Northwest District Attorney's District? Yes. Franklin County, Andrew County, that's all I Okay. And a lot of the cases that he's been involved in directly went to here, so. Okay, thank you. Oh, the questions, this is your last shot here. Yeah. <laughs> it's your best shot. <laughs> uh, Chief, I know that our department's between 85 and 90 percent, mostly personnel is mostly your Biggest chunk of your budget, you're now uh, getting your ranks just about to. Well, 88.5% is the actual person. Oh, sure. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yes, I <laughs> Use my $9 calculator. My, my well, budget's with all these years to figure that out. <laughs> that's, that's a substantial portion of the, devoted, the, the budget devoted principally to personnel. Um, <coughs> you, are, you are now about to, well, you're still in the process of. Uh, getting your ranks up to uh, the full complement. Mm -hmm. Well, we had to because an issue happened almost two years ago. <coughs> uh, we kind of got in some of our supervisory positions. And I come in and there, you know, two captains, two lieutenants, three new sergeants. Couldn't just do it all at once. We had to do it in a transition. Um, Short sure control, of course, a few people, but not everybody, because you still got to answer the calls. So if you participated in the interview process as we've gone through class after class after <coughs> four, five, people brought in. So, um, and it's, it's more difficult to recruit. There's fewer people applying for this job. Uh, we had uh, some really good candidates that uh, were in our top cut. And one has an on-site exotic cancer site. And another one, because we do really thorough backgrounds, turned out he had some involved in child pornography and all over. So we ended up washing those people out. So the other high candidates Washed out, and then we went through another round of second year for the last time, so we just gave in April. Of course. But again, they managed me on the civil service, having our own testing, and we get the scores back in a week and we can get them rolling. 
So we've got three at Academy now. We've got three ready to go in August. A couple backups in case one of those fails. So it's just keep falling along. Well, as you transition out, you have a department that's actually pretty young, by and large. So all from, from top down. Yep. Uh, you see any advantages or disadvantages to that going forward, uh, budgetarily speaking? Well, budgetarily, it's we have to invest a lot of time in training our supervisors. Uh, you know, experience is very beneficial, but we have a lot of specializations, so we need to train people for that. We need to train the supervisors and their skills and abilities to be supervisors. We're spending a lot of money on recruit training, academy training, field training <laughs> program, uh, and just keep replacing people as they get promoted from crime scene units or supervisory role or Drill. You still use those people for all those specialties, you know, whether it's uh, accident reconstruction, collision reconstruction, or any of the other things that we do. Uh, so it's, it's always a balancing act. And, and the disadvantage is it's, it's the generation of millennials that are just, they don't seem to be as committed to a place for a job like I was, you know, could, could better or worse 37 years yet. They don't have the interest in the job, and they don't have the commitment to geography. They'll move for something else, something that appears to be in the And whether it's money, a couple of recent ones went to large departments just because there was, they knew that given all the young people around them, there was not a lot of chance for them to advance. And in their exit interviews, I mean, they actually commented that because they're college educated and they can't be an officer, they're going to be stars in these other bigger city departments in no time. So, and I've talked to the chiefs in those departments, and he agrees. He's like, yeah, people are going to be moving up pretty quick here. Got to give them what, what they've got. So. so it's a shame that we're kind of a training ground, but it goes a long way when you have officers here that know officers first name and other departments, investigations and contact, and information sharing. So there is some benefit to this impact. So in, in what would you say is, and this would be somewhat an aspect of your exit, uh, interview, but what would you say would the, be the thing that we need to work on most going forward with the department, particularly uh, as it relates to the budget and also the, the culture of the police department? Well, again, I'm not just going to say money, you know, uh, but that would certainly be beneficial. We've made some steps in this last contract. Uh, the first responder stipend uh, for the officers because the extra training they get, not only for the naloxone stuff, but mental health first aid and critical incident. Intervention techniques and whatnot. Very few police departments do that, but the curriculum that we set up for that has now been adopted by the Basic Recruit Academy because we did that with a grant with DPH and DMH two years ago. Got everybody trained and moved to the CIT stuff. Got every, not everybody, most everybody trained. They got another group of people trained on traumatic brain injury because we have a fairly high population of returning veterans that have soldiers around that have issues that we need to be able to diagnose with some experience and knowledge instead of just reacting to law enforcement and you know, charge them and let the court sort it out type thing. That's what the mental first aid does, that's what the CIT stuff does. So you know, what could change? You know, we, we did a quality of life survey you know, and amazingly out of the CL5, pretty much everybody was in four to four and a half happy with the department, happy with the training, happy with the building, happy with the leadership and supervisors that work with. One thing that they come up with is there's kind of a little less sense of camaraderie than there used to be. Um, and they said there were some issues about communication from the top down. So we started a newsletter just two months ago that we can discuss all kinds of topics that come up. So everybody gets informed the same way in writing as opposed to you talk to the union people and then they tell somebody else and somebody else and then the story gets all convoluted. So we're improving the communication, top down communication. We're trying to do more department oriented things like our community day. Kids day, uh, football game, uh, a cookout. Uh, try, try to do the police call, but that's kind of an older generation thing. Everybody much preferred going to big picnics so kids and everybody could have fun with them just doing that. We're trying to give them a sense of identity with the police department and the city and kind of rebuild that camaraderie amongst them. But it is, it, that's kind of a generational thing. People go off and do their own things. So, Try to identify things, take steps. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm
Yep, just a quick point that, uh, as I've said many times, through my line of work, I see, um, as a criminal defense attorney, how how um, how decent and, and good the police are to people with mental health issues. And uh, I just want to point out that out one more time, and how compared to other agencies, even agencies in the area, that that this department just really seems to be uh, at, the, at the top and a, and a model for that. Appreciate you saying. We're the last stop social service agency, psychological service agency. So you got to have your people trained and willing. And you kind of recruit for that kind of mindset, too. So. Any other questions or comments to the Chief? Councilor? Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, Chief. Yeah, I, I think it was. I think it was. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, and, uh, and I'm sorry this is going to be the last opportunity we get to torture you like this and have you come in. We did, we did put you up, number one, you're 5 o'clock on, on the dot. Of course, we have another retirement chief coming right behind you. This is like a, but I did that. Uh, yeah. He was my executive seniority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see my son graduate, so. Thank you very much for for your service, for your dedication to the community and the department that you've created, so, and your commitment to the community. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for working with all these. I always appreciate it. You've always been good to me. The mayors, David, Claire, and Mary, were super. Basically, let me run the department out of town so you can get them out of trouble. I think I did okay. So you did do all right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. See you later. A little rusty from Sherman Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> you missed out? You already passed the form <laughs> Are you coming to Bridge Street Reunion? Um, there's a Bridge Street Reunion? Oh, you're going to be out of town. Sorry. The 100 year reunion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. She didn't use my story about how well I knew the principal's office. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you. Take care. Take care. Next up is fire, but we actually scheduled for 520, so you'll we'll have to take a breather. We'll take a breather on the show to and see each other for a few minutes until we uh, two minutes. So. We have the Jeffrey music. No, I don't think we. I don't think it'd be fair to people. <laughs> How about that weather? Hot enough for you. Dennis Leary did pop up on my phone yesterday. Why? Why? Well, I'll play it for you later. Jeez. He never calls me. It's appropriate to open our two five Yes, right. That's right. That's right. Dennis Leary is the. Rescue is it? <coughs> yes, he's the. Firefighter is uh, is the celebrity representative. Firefighter. He's a Worcester. He's a Worcester. very that horrible fire in Worcester. And I guess his family's fire. He's a Malone of my old Is he? Yes. Yeah. Oh, with Emerson. And with Emerson. He does a little fire. He does some of the talks about how about that heat service. That's right. Yeah, there's any number of plausible connections to the Senate. It's pretty true. Oh, by the way, Nebraska overrode the veto of the governor and the death penalty is abolished in Nebraska. <laughs> Being sentenced to Nebraska is worse than any death penalty. <laughs> okay. Boom. All right. Next up is in the cavalcade of retiring chiefs. We have, uh, uh, Chief Ryan Duggan is here with his, his uh, two DCs, are, uh, Norris and Nichols, are here as well. You guys going to stay in the back for the time being?
All right. Uh, they, they can come up. You, know, you can go if you want. I'm looking forward to the torture, but we need to pass it on and share it. So we have uh, Assistant Chief Nichols and Deputy Chief Norris, who probably can answer many questions better than that. And by the way, uh, the budget page is 56 for right now. We're uh, fired here. Take it away, Brian. Right. Another, I mean, get another swan song in the lame duck. Okay. That's right. All right. <laughs> Um, well, just sort of reflecting on, on this year, um, we've accomplished a lot, and, and that's sort of symbolic of what we've accomplished going from 16 into 17 years of myself being here. I, I don't think when I walked in the door, I thought I'd be here that long. So uh, it has certainly been a very good ride, thanks much to the support of the mayor and, and the council support as well. Um, in, in terms of the department, there are some notable changes. Uh, when I walked in the door, we were doing about 800 and something calls a year. Now, as you can see on page 56, we're doing about 7,000. That goes up and down each year, but that, that's a tremendous change from the doors being closed, except when the bell rang to go to Walter Salvo House, to really being engaged in the community from ALS Ambulance, not only for our community, but Intercept for the region. Uh, and a transition from sort of a closed organization that in many ways was considered a black sheep to one of a regional leader. Uh, so that, that's something that, while I'm proud of it, it's our people that should really be proud and, and step back for a minute as the organization transitions. And whenever there's a transition, there's a great opportunity for new energy and leadership and, and so forth. But uh, I'm sort of encouraging our people to take that step back and look at from where we've come and walk in the shoes that have brought us there a little bit. Uh, so we're sort of in that process right now. Um, so another notable thing, I can remember years when we typically had 140, 130 fires. This year we had 66. And I think last year maybe when I was in front of the finance committee, I mentioned sort of the decline nationwide of fires. Uh, that's both a tremendous success and a problem. So it's a success in that we've had 66 fires. We still have $2.3 million in fire damage, which is pretty average for a community of our size. Uh, most fires are in single family dwellings with multifamily being a close runner up. And fortunately, we've had no real deaths this year. Uh, that, that's the one thing that the day I started, we had a fire death and we've been very fortunate throughout the years <coughs> short of the arson spree to have very few fire deaths. Uh, so that's another accomplishment of our fire prevention programs and, and people doing sort of the intangible things behind the scenes. Um, so, so in terms of a problem, what that presents for the organization going forward is, is a new study out that says if you become a firefighter today, you can expect to see 10 serious fires in your career. And then they break it down and it's like three or four as a firefighter and so many of the company officer and a battalion chief and, and a chief. But just think in terms of skill retention, what that does. And, and in terms of knowledge, I mean, we're, we're just doing a captain and deputies exam now with people that have been on a relatively short time. And most of them, by and large, haven't seen a whole lot of fire for that experience. So the fire service is transitioning more to education, more to a training base to keep those skills going. And that's going to be one of the challenges going forward, of really trying to retain those skills. Because it's a different environment from a, even a training live fire burn to pull up in front of a structure and have someone trapped and have to deal with, with the stress and priorities and safety around that. So, and, and that's something we need to really keep in the forefront of our minds. Other good things that happened during the year, we, we finished our transition to paramedic engine companies, which the, probably the biggest question I've got over the years is why does an engine company go when there's an ambulance and stuff? And, and many of you have asked me that as well. The mayor's asked me <laughs> repeatedly. So, so I, I constantly give the answer that while it doesn't go all the time, it goes to the top 25% of the most serious emergencies when a team is needed. Since we've instituted that, well, prior to instituting that, we had three or four back injuries. One was over $400,000 in its own cost. Since we've instituted that, knock on wood, we've had basically no major injuries. So just in terms of injury prevention, it's a success. But the more important thing is having a team to care for a patient in those critical situations. And now taking it the next step forward into 
having paramedics on each engine company that can treat the patient even if an ambulance isn't available. So starting those drug therapies and intervening while we're waiting either for one of our ambulances or mutual aid ambulance. So uh, we also completed a transition and, and some sort of bargaining to get there. When the state used to be their own certifying entity, they've now said, well, we're out of that business. We're going to go to the national registry. And we had to do some uh, things with that, but we've completed that. Uh, and also sort of two folks, and I'm going to ask Deputy Norris to come up uh, to talk about the opiate task force as well as the ultraviolet decontamination, both things that we're sort of the regional leader in. Um, so you want to start with the ultraviolet decontamination system? Um, <clears throat> about two months ago, one of the firefighters brought forward the concept of um, one of the uh, new and innovative technologies of trying to improve the health and safety of the firefighters Whereas all these calls, they go on, um, they come in contact with a bunch of different contagious diseases that are out there. And one of the things to the research that they found was the ultraviolet-like technology, similar to if you were drive by Cooley Dixon Hospital, uh, early in the morning or late at night, you might see a strobe light flashing from the windows up there. It actually looks like almost like a fire alarm strobe going off. Um, that's their uh, technology. They're using, using ultraviolet-like technology. There is a handheld unit and also a tripod unit, a smaller unit, that is uh, designed for ambulances. Um, so we're doing a little bit more research um, with one of our firefighters, Matthew Martian. Uh, we were able to procure two of the smaller tripod units, one for each station. And then we also bought one handheld unit. Uh, the, hand, the purpose of the handheld unit is to keep the in those areas where the line of sight might not be able to reach, uh, whether it's the radios or the patient, uh, the uh, driver compartment, things like that. <clears throat> um, so that has uh, that's still kind of in its trial period. Like I said, it's been about two months now. Um, but just of note is this really kind of stemmed from the whole uh, e Ebola concerns that were out there, and that's what kind of got the ball rolling. Um, we worked with Cooley Dixon Hospital, set up some agreements, so not only. Um, can we decon our units, but also uh, any other one who needs assistance by Cooley Dick. And in fact, uh, within the last two or three weeks, uh, Amherst had a, a pretty significant uh, call, and they actually drove by our headquarters on their way back to Amherst and uh, uh, used um, this uh, technology, and they're looking into uh, getting that for their service as well. And then the Open Task Force. Um, the department, uh, we've been working with the DA's office for about two or three months now, um, in particular Marty Murphy Keene and her group, um, trying to look at different trends that are out there, um, particularly been focused in the last two years. And just here in Northampton alone, um, over the last two years, we actually had 20 cases in 2013. In 2014, we had 41 cases of overdoses here in the city, um, a significant number. And uh, I know I, I, watched that. I heard the police talking about it earlier. Um, through the DA's office and his outreach program, um, they were able to train a lot of the first responders, particularly the PD. Um, we had our personnel um, already trained, obviously, with the ambulances and you know, paramedics and things like that. But it's been a nice cooperative, uh, nice cooperative training uh, program going forward. We're continuing to work with the DA's office, meeting with them on a regular basis to try to take that next step to figure out what can be done regionally to minimize these overdoses from occurring, uh, particularly here in Northampton and Hampshire County. So stay tuned on that. So. Uh, Chris, were those overdose deaths or were those just overdoses? They were overdose deaths. I know uh, out of 41 that we had last year, eight of them led to fatalities. Uh, but, and how many of them were Narcan resuscitations? The, the remaining were all Narcan oh. resuscitated. Um, a lot of it comes down to, uh, it really comes down to the early notification. Right. Um, the guys and girls are phenomenal in the training and their expertise as to what they can do. But if they're not notified in a timely manner, um, it reaches that point where no matter what they get or what interventions they do, it's been gone too long. Thank you. Yep. So, Transitioning into next year's budget, it's actually probably the simplest budget I've ever done. $5.7 million, 
represents really two changes. Uh, one change is the increase of 0.15 employees to uh, bring our administrative assistant, Melissa Browski, from part-time status to full-time status. Um, something we've been trying to do, and the mayor's actually been trying to do with us for several years, but she was always resistant to it, and she's had some life changes that allow that. So that will give us a little bit more capacity that way. And the other change is an increase in sort of the dollars we put away for ambulances to transition from, if you remember when we started the ambulance program, we were buying them with lease and arrears, meaning we would pay after we got the unit and pay multiple payments. We're now trying to slowly transition to more of a cash purchase system uh, through putting some money aside for that. So those are really the only changes. Other than that, we have 68 employees. We're retaining 68 employees uh, for sworn personnel, and everything is really the same as it goes forward. Any questions? Uh, Council of Warren. Brian Captain on that vacancy. Who, who was that? Um, this is on page 57. Okay, that is Captain Clark, who is retiring on July 11th. So you're going to have to fill that. Yes, and, and we're in process now of doing uh, both an assessment for captains, the list typically last two years. We're sort of a little behind the two-year mark, but we're doing that in early July, and we're also doing deputy chief. Uh, just put the mayor in a good place so that with the transition that's going on, there'll be some choices uh, should be made. Um, is it the case that the, the cost of, of Narcan is, is really rising? Um, that's what I've heard kind of from a statewide regional perspective, just because the companies that make it are taking advantage of the need for it. I was wondering if you found that. Yeah, I, I have heard that as well, but the, the person I actually asked is Chris. <laughs> for you. <coughs> that is absolutely accurate. Okay. Um, that's going to be one of the challenges going forward is right now, um, through a grant from DA's office, um, my understanding is most of the first responder services got their initial um, SARP kits um, for free through this grant program. Just like any grant program, typically, typically the intent is to get the startup going and then how to continue that is the question. But um, the cost of Narcan on the ambulance side, we're fortunate because through the hospital we have the agreements of a one-for-one -one exchange. So if the ambulance was to go out today, <clears throat> administer um, one dose of Narcan, when they transfer that patient to Cooley Dick, they get that one-for-one -one exchange at no cost. Mm. Um, compared to um, other services out there, um, they may not have those agreements in place. Um, on the fleet side, if they administer it, it might be a little bit more challenging. Um, but the cost right now, um, has at least quadrupled in price within the last three to six months, um, without a doubt. And obviously, it, it saves lives from the statistics we just, just brought up. Yeah, a a absolutely. Um, so that that's the unfortunate thing is why is the cost going up? We all have our own thoughts, but the reality is it is going up, and that's one of the challenges going forward. It has a shelf life. Most of it has a shelf life of two years. Really? So once you get it, um, depending on what concentration and what brand you get, typically it's good for two years. Mm -hmm. But at that point, then what? Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the irony there is I think they're using the same model as drug dealers. First case is free. <laughs> once, you need it, once you need it, the bulk of the costs go up. And now as, as expanded use of Narcan, it's, it's not production costs, I'm pretty sure. It's just the fact that there are communities prepared to pay for it. That's it. And, and, you know, and along the same lines, the chief mentioned earlier about the paramedic uh, engine response companies we have. That was one of the huge benefits of getting those licenses to paramedic level was now that we have that, now they, we had people certified and trained to do it. We didn't have the equipment and resources to let them do their job. Now through that paramedic program, they have it. They had Narcan. Um, and we've had some successful resuscitations um, with them arriving on scene first and administering with the engines. So. Which comes from Thank you very much to the department. Appreciate what you do for the city. Um, I'm just wondering if, uh, when you do assist calls to other cities, other nearby towns and cities, if there's a way that um, costs are recouped by our our fire department. Um, by master and law, it's not allowed. Uh, other states do that. For example, New Hampshire, they have communities and they keep a tally, and at the end of the year, whoever owes pays. <laughs> 
uh, just not allowed by law under the mutual aid laws in Massachusetts. So, and, and I'd say all in all, um, we get a pretty balanced shake of the tail. That between ambulance mutual aid coming in and we'll provide more fire task force aid going out to other communities uh, and probably a little bit more fire aid than we get, but we get more ambulance aid than we probably give other than there's one community, Hatfield, which they're sort of struggling to staff their ambulance and we're doing a good portion of that. So, um, but I think on the whole it's pretty balanced. I'll throw out. I just want to say to you, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you. Thank you for everything you've done for the city and uh, thank you for the great transformation at the department scene from your tenure and uh, it's a great time. I truly appreciate it. Council of Barge. Brian, I want to thank you. Um, I know I was a counselor then going through the interviewing process and I think our city has come a long way. I think we've put a tremendous amount of effort into our fire department and I want to thank you and all your men and women for doing what you've done for our city and thank you and you will be missed dearly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to piggyback on that, um, in fact actually it's, it is remarkable coincidental that we are have two chiefs who took over departments that were, um, well let's just say they weren't quite up to the standards that they are now. Uh, literally transform the departments into agencies that are the envy of surrounding communities. I don't know, most, most folks don't know that in the periphery. They, everyone understands in Northampton that uh, they take a lot for granted, but the fact is, is that regionally, both these departments, your department and and and, uh, and Chief Sinkwitz's departments, are held in the highest regard and used as, actually as a high bar for other for other agencies and an aspiration something we take for granted I'd like you to know that we do not in, in certainly in this forum and we're very appreciative of the, of, the, of the work and the transformation that you committed in in that relatively brief 17 years it, it does make me feel old to watch people retire that I was here when they got hired so well, Bill you were one of the first people I met and you still stuck around with me. I, had, I had hair down to here and, I, and yeah. It's, yeah, I'm sure you walked in this town and said, "Oh, great! This is this is the face of government." That, that was uh, somewhat of a deciding factor. But... <laughs> well, I'm, glad, I'm glad I didn't scare you off, Brian. So, no. thank you so much. And, and, and it's and been it, excellent to work with the council. I really appreciate all the support we've got. You know, that there, I'm sure there'll be challenges going forward as Dwayne's in charge of operations. He's come to me and really highlighted that the condition of apparatus and things that need to happen in the future. So I think that's going to be a challenge as well as when, when I first got here, I remember um, the, some of the members would call the people the white shirts and the blue shirts, meaning officers and firefighters. I think that's faded some, but there's still sort of a cultural barrier to have people really see and identify the services and the value they provide to the city and really work with the city and continue that transformation. Well, and again, to your credit, I think now the department, uh, people are becoming more cognizant of the people who work for the fire department, and in turn, the people in the fire department are starting to become more cognizant of the community that they're working in. And, uh, um, and that's all to your credit, so thanks again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Wayne, Chris, thank you very much for coming in. All right, have a good night. You too, good luck, Wayne. All right, bye-bye. Thanks. 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 We have one minute before we go to the next hearing. <laughs> Oh, and Rick Santorum just officially announced his presidential vote. So did you. Who? So did you? As a Republican? There's plenty of room in the front car for you. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. All right, we're there. We go. All right, next oh up, uh, okay. schools, it's on page 102. And fortunately, we're not saying goodbye to the superintendent in this case. That's how you go. <laughs> we're actually more or less saying welcome. Uh, this, is, this has been the end of careers in their presentation and now the beginning of a, a presentation from the superintendent. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I'm very happy to be on the front end of that whole continuing of flight experience. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon to discuss the FY16 school budget. Many administrators have put long hours into the development of this budget, which I know you've gotten um, a large sample of in the, in the city budget. Uh, but our school business manager, Candace Walzak, who's with me this afternoon, deserves special recognition for the yeoman's work that she's put into the document. Things that helped in this year's budget included savings and payroll accounts and unemployment costs. Things that hurt in this year's budget cycle included increases in utility costs and reductions in state support for preschool and kindergarten. I have described this budget as a level service budget with an overall increase of 3%. However, I think the budget does a lot more than is captured in that sound bite. Um, it allows us to address structural deficits that have taken root, especially in the buildings and grounds, athletics, and supplies line items. It also um, creates an account for a sick leave buyback, a liability that shifted to the schools this year. It also includes detailed documentation of individual cost centers, including a sport-by-sport -sport analysis of costs and revenues within the athletics cost center. The budget also attempts to proactively address future needs by describing a stability plan that is not unlike the city's fiscal stability plan. If our assumptions hold up and we're able to continue to budget conservatively, we hope to be able to extend the period of fiscal stability for at least one more year beyond FY16. During the budget process, the principals presented some forward-looking and proactive strategies to provide services that are focused on the prevention of learning problems at an early stage rather than on remediation later on. But given our future year's budget projections and our goal of extending fiscal stability for as long as possible, we determined that these new programs would have to be paid for on a pay-as-you-go fashion through savings through other parts of the budget. So the budget also contains about $160,000 of restructuring based upon the philosophy of directing resources to children while they are still in the prime developmental periods for growth. The budget also includes a contingency plan in the event that the governor's reductions to the kindergarten grant remain in effect. Some of these contingencies may also be needed to address a recently announced change to preschool funding. Essentially, the change to preschool funding will result in the redistribution of funds that are now shared by 150 Massachusetts communities, including Northampton, among more than 300 communities um, without any increased money in the pot. So um, we estimate that the effect of this redistribution for Northampton will be a loss of about $30,000 in its preschool funds. Um, and that comes on top of potential $90,000 cut in the kindergarten grant in the, gun, in the governor's budget. So uh, the kindergarten grants were eliminated in the, fully in the governor's budget and then reinstated fully in the house budget and then reduced to a million dollars for the purposes of conferencing in the Senate budget. So the fate of the kindergarten grants now locks in the conference process. Um, but as I said, our budget includes contingencies for dealing with these cuts in a way that doesn't sacrifice services for our youngest children. But depending on the total amount of the cuts in these two programs, there is a possibility that we may need to leave one position unfilled that's being created due to retirement this summer. Um, so in summary, I would just represent that the budget approved by the Northampton School Committee for FY16 continues to build upon the foundations that have been laid in recent years and it enhances the sustainability of our programs, and I respectfully urge your support. Council, any questions? No comments.
Four year four. Come through now. Um, which which uh, school would have the, the possible vacant kindergarten teacher? There wouldn't be a kindergarten teacher that no. wouldn't be replaced. It would be a custodian. Oh, I see. Um, so the vacancy would occur at Ryan Road. Any other questions or comments? Well, Council okay. so, Inspector is a lame duck, so I can say that. <laughs> Um, so one of the issues that was certainly a hot button issue three, four years ago, um, to were touching upon was the potential closing of an elementary school down the road um, when we looked at the demographics that were coming. Is that discussion still taking place? Is that something that is way off in the future, or is it just been kind of you know, dropped off the map? I would say that it is um, something that is referenced from time to time, but is not an active discussion. Um, you know, when I look at the kindergarten needs that we have right now, you know, we're at a point where we have strongly nine kindergartens, fitting nine kindergartens into three elementary schools seems like it would be a real stretch. Considering that that's nine, you know, first grades and second grades and third grades and fourth grades and fifth grades as well. Thanks. Council LeBarge. Yes. You just mentioned that there would be a vacancy at Ryan Road Custodian. Yes. We have two? Yes. And so what shift would you be looking at? So one of the things we would do is, if the funding didn't come through, right. that we would increase overtime in the um, custodial line items and not replace the, the second shift custodian at Ryan Road. So there are times when we would still need to bring someone in for a second shift, but we'd be paying that through overtime. And how did you make that decision? Because it was a vacancy that was occurring, so we wouldn't incur okay. the uh, unemployment costs as well. Makes sense. Dr. Carter. Um, you made a reference to one of the bigger challenges with the budget being utilities. And I'm just wondering um, if, if that, if you see that that would be even a greater challenge, were it, were it not for the um, the great improvements that we've had in central services, I don't know. If, I mean, maybe you weren't here to see all those, but have have been able to look back over the year? Is it uh, was it helpful to at least have all of those upgrades and improvements? So to paint it with sort of a broad brush. Um, the, the way I summarize this in my mind is that those upgrades have uh, reduced the energy usage of the district by about 30 percent. Mm -hmm. The utilities increases we saw last year were about 40 percent in increase in rates. Um, so I'm very glad that we had that, um, but the increase in rates is more than eating up the increases in efficiency. Okay. It was for the 33 and a half percent increase by. Uh, now we'll put it in there, which is now gone down. Yeah. Which is now gone down. Uh, Dr. Provost, the, the, uh, you alluded to the census, of course, and the trend of census, which might, would obviously have an impact. Um, I, and the other challenge is, as you, as you know, as you walk into, of course, is the um, diminishing commitment from the state uh, and, and also how we are compensated for charter schools, which we are we are encircled by charter schools. Uh, Northampton always is kind of we, we're stuck in this nexus, of course, uh, 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 as a consequence of Edward form, But Northampton just sort of is in limbo compared to other communities in some respects. I mean, while we enjoy uh, excellent schools and and community support and commitment to it. Uh, there's always the aspiration to do more, but as you see going forward, as, you, as your legacy is yet to be established, do you, what do you anticipate are going to be the bigger challenges? Is it going to be things such as a reduce or diminishing census, or is that trending up, or, or is it the fact that if we stay on this course of uh, the state's um, lack of support uh, from, from revenues, where we have to generate it based on property taxes, or those which I, I assume it's a combination of all of them, but what, what are the bigger red flags that you're staring at? I, I would prioritize the challenges presented by the state funding formulas. I think that in addition to Northampton kind of being caught in a perfect storm, if you will, of being encircled by charter schools, it's also caught in a perfect storm of 
having the presumption under the state's formula of being able to always raise enough money in taxes to cover the increase in the minimum net required school spending, which means that the state um, never has to increase its funding substantially. So the um, increase we've gotten this year, or at least the proposed increase in this version of the budget is $25 per student, which is the same increase that we've gotten for several years. It's the minimum increase. And um, $25 per student doesn't go very far. Uh, so I think that's I think that's the biggest challenge. My hope is that um, my hope is that we can sustain our previous sustain a, you know stability to the point where there's some change in the, the state funding formula so that we're able to get some assistance on that end. That that hope has been eternal actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's been for over a decade now. But the fact is is that we we. Um, uh, not unlike fire department, they're victims of their own success. They are managed to uh, uh, educate enough people that they, there's less fires and they respond more promptly. And so consequently, they're less left with more creative ways to try and uh, fund themselves and also how to how to occupy themselves. <coughs> Northampton also is a victim of this lease under ed reform and, and uh, the education formula that we have, Northampton has expressed time and time again a deep commitment to education of, of the children in this community and as a result we are rewarded with ambivalence so uh, council murphy well we've always done very well um, as a desirable public school district i mean we we've, we've never we, we've always imported more students than we've exported and that's still holding true as i, I well the, the net choice. from all of the choices is that we're down Slightly. Um, so if you take charter school out and choice out and choice, choice in, in, I think we're maybe down 18 students or something in that whole mix. But the problem with the funding is that net change of 18 students comes out to $900,000. Mm -hmm. You know, and a formula that gives us $5,000 for every student we take in. So there, there are just some inequities there that um, are really difficult to, to plan for as you build a budget. That's actually depicted on page 161 of the budget, that, 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 that formula on this there. But uh, it, it, the unfortunate circumstances, you know, in Holyoke make us all really glad that, uh, that we have a school system that we can be proud of here that, uh, you know, that does a, a good job with the students from Northampton. Uh, unfortunately, to the south, we get some pretty tough school systems. Uh, and unfortunately, that's where the state money tends to go. When you have systems in failure, that draws, draws the fund. I mean, it's unfortunate for us to say that we're getting the minimum, but that tends to be the case if you're, you're doing OK with what you've got. In the eyes of the state, they have so many really terrible school systems they're going to try and shore off. You know. It's unfortunate for us, but we're still doing pretty good. Councilor, no. Um, I just like to ask kind of an open-ended question on a subject that you and I have actually spoken about before. But um, it's true that we're not the most suffering school district in in the region. But um, I'm not sure it's mentioned in this budget. But in your in your entry report, you certainly wrote about the increase in number of low-income students mm -hmm. um, generally in our school district and. I was just wondering if you could comment on that relative to the expenses and other challenges financially that come with that for the Northampton School District. And also, to weave in the thing that we did speak about, um, which, which is other pressures um, and other financial, financial losses that we see um, from other areas, um, like the cut in the food stamp program. Um, and th does that drive up the costs for our free and reduced lunch program? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd just be curious if you could add that kind of perspective to this. Sure. So what I would say is that all students do not cost the same to educate, which is one of the um, problems with the formula, statewide funding formula. Um, the formula does attempt to account to a certain extent for low-income status. Um, and I guess one of, one of the things that I talked about 
in the formula when I had an opportunity to um, discuss this with some of the people who understand it certainly much more than I do, is even if we were to be credited um, for an enormous influx of low-income students, we'd still have to eat through like $700,000 worth of anticipated increased costs before we could get to the point where the state would increase its support. Um, so I do think it's going to cost more and more as our population changes because the um, students that are, are appearing in our schools are, um, I think, more expensive to educate. But I think that for the short term, unless there's some form of that formula, those costs will fall locally. So I do think that that, you know, again, creates more pressures going down the road, which is why we kind of thought if we could get one more year after this year without having to face significant cuts, we'd be in a good position. But while we also make that, um, that prediction sort of very cautiously, knowing that our cost profile could change significantly depending on the changing populations of our schools. holistically to state, of course, where our continued reliance on property taxes, the regressive tax system to subsidize our schools as we, as the state diminishes its responsibility, which, or abdicates from their responsibility, which is to collect revenues from progressive taxation. We have the huge disparity in the quality of education, and Holyoke Service is a good example. A school system that, went, uh, that I went through that went into receivership not because of any, any malfeasance on the, the part of Williams, it's because we decided that if you're an affluent community, you will have the benefits of an affluent school system. If you're in the middle, like we are, or is, uh, you, you will have, the commitment from the state is on a par with your perceived affluence. And consequently, we have a tale of multiple cities, and, and the, the disparity there is no equity through how we subsidize education. It makes me crazy. And uh, it gets, it's been getting progressively worse and worse and worse. And this actually goes to the mayor's narrative in total, which is the fact that the pressures on the property, the fact that we were advocating on, on income and revenue and deferring to uh, the regressive tax system, it puts more pressure on local communities to try and find those sources of income, which is why the mayor uh, Talk about a pilot, for instance, or uh, we're going to we're going to try and function within the dysfunction. But I, let me be clear that there is a dysfunction here, and we will we will meet the conditions and terms of the challenges. But the fact remains is that this is a burden that has been it's distributed unfairly, it's being borne unfairly, and uh, ultimately, if we keep playing this game, the consequences are real. Perhaps that was my stump speech. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so, any other questions or comments for uh, Dr. Provost? Thank you so much. You're excused. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, what year did you graduate from Holyoke? <laughs> I, I got kicked out of Holyoke. <laughs> Uh, motions are made and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all very much. We have no other scheduled hearings for the budget except for the main budget hearing, the public hearing that will be before the council. Uh,